Well, welcome to the flight deck. Woo yeah, yeah, glad you're here. Um, you know, we're in this time right now that we're going from, we've been looking a lot at being in Egypt and then they're crossing over, right? This is the time with Passover and with Jesus being crucified and raised from the dead and into the wilderness time. The disciples are in that buffer time now between now and Pentecost. And we got to get over to the saturation point. Let's give you a couple good pictures, right? Of where we're coming from. At one point, I almost thought, almost thought from Egypt to Everest because it's Mount Sinai. But, you know, anyway, I had to get my alliteration going. So it goes from stigma to saturation, from abandonment to abundance, from harassment to harvest. Does it all sound good? Okay. No? Well, no, no, no. I mean, you're going from, you're going from, you're leaving those things, right? In Egypt. The stigma, the abandonment, and the harassment. Now, the abandonment was the feeling of abandonment. God, where are you? 430 years, right? And the crying out. And then God brings them out, but they're in this buffer time where it's like, it's, they're getting ready for the fullness and the saturation. The disciples are getting ready for the fullness and saturation that's going to happen by the Spirit people of Israel by hearing the voice of God and the word being revealed, but there's, there's a lot of push and pull in the midst of that that we're in. And so we've talked about the part of what God's trying to do, oh, from bondage to boldness, that's my last one. I, you know, I got alliteration, right? You get that? Because the, the issue is a lot of the churches come out of bondage but never move it into boldness. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Not worry. Uh, you know, it's, it's like, you know, Okay, and, and you know, it's, it's not a boldness. Unfortunately, when we've been bold, we've gone from being assertive to being either passive or being aggressive. And we're not supposed to be either. Not passive and not aggressive, but there is assertive. They're standing and saying, here we are. And we have to be different. And we've got to be distinct. We've got to have that voice for the broken and the hurting. And we've got to get a voice against injustice and racism. That's how, it's just... That's what it is. Jesus came to break down the wall of hostility between all those things. So we have to stand in that way. But there's a mindset that is so prevalent in Israel of that victim, victim, victim. And we talked about this last week. And God wants to promote them up to co-creator. And I don't, did, those of you who were here last week, did you all wrestle with this a little bit this week? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> This is a week of shifting, okay? You have to understand, this is God's calendar. It's not mine. He put it in there for a reason, and he is working his people for those who are willing. And I'm going to show you some words that have been brought out that from big prophets kind of thing. I'm, I kind of moved down and whatever. But, you know, I like to give you pictures to, again, move from that, that place of this is where we feel to that, that sense of confidence and looking straight up, right? Mm -hmm. But... And we're going to get a place in there. I want to show you some other balance in it. But just a quick check, right? Remember, we're always, this is our model. This is the carrier, right? And you're a plane on that. And so God uses that to speak to me. And this, this is going to go much bigger, just so you know. I won't tell you more about where that's all happening. But God's playing this out in time. And some of it's going to bypass the church and go into the marketplace. But what God kept bringing me up was this image of an E2 Hawkeye. You know what an E2 Hawkeye is? It's, it's a plane, a prop plane, the only prop plane that's on an aircraft carrier. And it takes off, and it goes up to about 25, 30,000 feet. And it sits up there, and it's, got, it's, it's vulnerable, so it actually has to have two F-15s or F-18s with it to protect it at all times. But from that place, there's four to five of them in a strike carrier group, and there's one always aloft at all time. And the reason being is this is the advantages that this thing can do is the perspective changes completely. It can detect aircraft from 250 miles away. Wow. Okay? So it can see way up there, see them coming. At 30,000 feet, it covers 120,000 square miles that it can watch over. Okay? Now, you think a carrier is a really amazing group, right? But they need this vision. They've got to understand the much bigger picture. In fact, if you put three of these things and they overlap, they can call, cover the whole of Central Europe. Wow. Now, when I mean cover it, I mean they cover it this way. The systems communicate with friendly aircraft. They do something called an IFF, which is you know, to determine whether it's friend or foe, identify friend or foe. And so they can vector the fighters towards the foes. 
A plane might not even see another plane on its radar, but the Hawkeye will see it and vector the plane over. Change your course bearing this and get over there. Okay, so it will intercept. You're starting to see some spiritual things in this, right? The natural follows the spiritual. It provides data on the threats and targets, but if you want some numbers, it extends their sensor range, that is of the planes, because now they can see further. And it also makes the offensive aircraft more difficult to trap, because if I'm a pilot in here and I have my radar going actively, guess what the other enemy can see? Sees the radar. So they can actually go into quiet mode and just get the radio signal from the Hawkeye who's tracking the other plane. See the advantage, right? Okay. And this plane can track 2,000 targets at the same time. And it can identify 20,000 targets simultaneously. Can't track them all, but it can identify and label them all. So in other words, it's got this huge field of vision. And then finally, it can guide 10 to one, or 40 to 100 engagements. In other words, this missile is going, that plane's attacking, this is going this. They are now using these for what they call combat, the entire battlefield uh, mission, because they can watch the tanks and all the movements of the troops and so forth and coordinate that. So they've even done things with a handoff where a ship will launch a missile and he can't even see the target, but the AWAC plane can, the Hawkeye can. Wow. And it takes over the guidance to make sure it goes exactly where it needs to be. Wow. But do you understand, this is what we have to have, is this. And part of what we try to give you every week you walk in here, because all of us get like this real fast. And it's my life and it's just my kids or just my neighborhood or just my job or just my little circle. And we keep trying to go, okay, there's much more going on of which this is an articulation. What you're seeing here is going on because of stuff that's also going on out here. And if you can see that, it makes more sense. And we get this perspective and you just kind of like, okay. I'm not that strange. Well. <laughs> oh, <yes. laughs> Some of you really are. Mm -hmm. About two bubbles off center. But we keep wanting to, wanting to do that. But this is, God kept bringing these images of these planes. I find them kind of unique, actually. They, they have eight prop. They're, they're actually nicknamed the Hummer because of the noise in me like that, not like a jet or anything else. But these guys go up, they're amazing. But then this word came down from glory of Zion. See, I, we track with how prophetic words are coming out. Because I kept feeling like there's something about big picture we gotta make sure we're watching in this time. It's why we watch the times and seasons. And this word was released. Hear my call this week for I'm calling you to come up and see. How's that for an interesting link? There are things that you are not having clear perspective on, but I will cause you to see if you will just praise me throughout the day. Do you get that? Yeah. Yeah. You can yeah. <laughs> elevate it up to that perspective. Yeah. I will inhabit you. I will ride with you to a place where you see that situation in a new way. Okay, so this got released from glory of Zion. Completely in it. And so, see, this is where I, I connect dots. And I go, okay, God, you keep giving me this thing. I know it's something about perspective. I don't know all the details. And then this word comes up. So let me give you some more of this because I think this is timely. I'm causing the ground to cry out because the ground is crying out. I'm watering it from the heavens. The heavens are shifting because the ground has cried out and it is Judah that will flow into the season ahead. Judah will go first for a new war season is at hand. Let the heavens shift. Let the earth cry out and watch as you see your paths change and open up. You need to hear that and watch as you see your paths change and open up. For this will be a week of changing paths and rearranging paths. Any of you had your path rearranged or changed this week? I had a few phone calls and stuff just going, wow, okay. Okay. If not, just stay on the ready. From your place of praise, you will see the order of the direction of your day. Let your days be reordered this week. In other words, just because you've done it every week on Friday, don't necessarily count on doing that tomorrow. Amen. Just telling you. Be open to what God wants to shift. He's sending you signals from that AWAC plane going, hey, pay attention to this. You can keep going, but he's vectoring you into some other place. Okay. 
I am rearranging the sounds of the earth. The rivers are shifting. The land is shifting. Seeds that have been sown will now come to the surface and be redeposited. What you have cast on the water will now be returned. Lord, and if you want that word, please, 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 yeah, come on, come on, come on. Yes. This is a season of refilling. I'm filling the broken cracks, cracks in the land, and cracks in you. Thank you Lord. Some of you are very cracked up, cracked, <laughs> but whatever. Some of you Okay, they're really, the one in the back, they just lost it. So we'll, we'll get them back in a half hour. Okay. So listen, listen to this. Allow me to fill up that which was broken in another season. Okay? The places that were broken, there's a filling that's coming in there. For I am the potter, this is a real important part of it, and you are the clay. I break that which is upon my wheel that I may remake you, refashion you, and remold you to be the glorious vessel that I've called you to be. I must change the vessels in the earth. For though you have been one way, I must remake you now. I must remake my church. I must remake the gifts in my church so that I can pour in again and pour out in a new way. Okay? Are you hearing? I know there's a lot there. But just let it wash over you. The Spirit will take and imprint things. The slides will be up in Dropbox and the replay will be on YouTube. So there's some more. I saw the drought in you and around you because you have set yourself, this is important, because you have set yourself against the potter's wheel. In other words, you've resisted what God wanted to do. And because you have set yourself against the refiner's fire, I sent the storm to break up the fallow land and moisten it. Jim's thing about breaking up the fallow land. Mm -hmm. And so I can mold it. Embrace the molding and you will receive the new identity of the new image I have in store for you. Come into a place of submission to my wheel and you will see the vessel of honor I have called you to be. Glory. Okay, are you hearing some? Okay. Allow me to fill up that which was broken in another season, for I am the potter and you are the clay. I break that which is upon my wheel, that I may remake you, refashion you, and remold you to be the glorious vessel. I just did that one. Okay. Well, obviously I needed to repeat it. <laughs> For those of you who didn't hear it the first time. Okay. This is you. Yeah, but this is this is what this is what yeah, no no no. You're in you have to understand this is part of the identity shift that God is so trying to get through, okay? No stupid sheep. Okay, you are armed and dangerous and it will be for good or evil, but you got to stop thinking that you're just not whatever, okay? You are that. And in this time of brokenness, when God's trying to say, I need you to get out of victim mindset, because this is how most of you see yourself is right here. That's an F-18 from a mid-air collision. Now, this is often a lot of our identity. I can't really fly. I can't really do anything. This is me. And God's like, you know what? It's okay. I got you. And I really like the brokenness because that makes you more malleable to me. And more humble about the mission and not arrogant and not aggressive, but you can't be passive. I need you in the fight. So, this is you. Um, I was talking to Nikki earlier today. She couldn't be here tonight, but she's going to be here next week and we want to pray over her. She took a job three years ago, and she was um, given a complicated job that came kind of with the reputation of a bad guy. So she stepped into this job where she like, couldn't win from the beginning. People literally would um, hide in their office and turn off the lights like they weren't there when they saw her coming. Not because of anything she had even had a chance to do, but just the reputation that came with the job. And she was frustrated because she felt like she hasn't been able to carry God into that place like she wants to. Nothing's been able to break open because of this reputation that she has. And we began to talk about, you know, regardless of what the reputation is, we have to remember who you are and what you carry in there just by walking in there every day. But we need to pray off that reputation. You know, we need to shore you up and pray off that reputation so that you can walk in there and be all that God wants you to be. Amen. Yep. 
So there'll be a fight for it, right? All the way through. But it's, it's ultimately his power, but there's a will factor and there's a wisdom factor of applying that and then making it work. So I just want you to see some of these images because I need them to imprint on you. I have two screens up. I got a standing desk now. And I have all these pictures are in a folder that pulls up on my desktop. And so at different times in the day, these things will come up and just kind of whoosh and, and hit you. And it's kind of like, okay, I got to remember what we're about, okay? Now, again, it's on a mission of wholeness, of shalom, of bringing peace into people that have no peace, of pulling down the stuff that's setting against Nikki, tearing it down. But there's, there's a place for us to stand in. We have a trigger to pull. We have a role to play. And we gotta make sure we're about it. So again, get the, let the image, see yourself, Lord, launch me, launch me, launch me. And speaking of launch, this was a word that somebody forwarded me from the Netherlands. <laughs> but it's actually from Johnny Enlow. And it's called the coming blue wave of the blue hairs. Wow. How many of you are 50 or older? Number, yeah. Okay. So here we go. Yes, some of you don't want to admit. I saw that hand back there. Okay. We don't look it. Well, you don't look it. Yeah, I know. You look more like 60. No, sorry. <coughs> That's not true. That's not true. Bill, you don't look a day over 59. It's really true. Okay. So just listen to this. Last night, I began getting some preliminary revelation on what is coming this Rosh Hashanah. That's the new year coming up in September. I saw a tsunami. By the way, Johnny Enlow, do you know him? Am I needing to get? Okay, he is one of the prophets that's out there. He's really in uh, about the seven mountains. He has something called the seven mountain prophecy, um, the seven mountain mantle. Good guy. Um, pretty highly prophetic, moves in a lot of signs. Anyway, good, good man. I'm sorry? He started in Georgia, but he's now in California. So I saw a tsunami arising as a blue wave, both in the church and in society. I saw that this wave was a shock to most as it was a wave of people being propelled to the forefront. As previously strong leaders of the church and society watched these people begin to be catapulted <laughs> past them. You know, how a plane gets, okay, I connect the dots. And it caused them disorientation as they seemed to have lost their place and were unsure even how to maneuver. It was a new day which required major adjustments. These catapulted ones had the uniqueness of all having that which looked like a burlap bag on them, and I heard that these all carried mantles of humility. I heard that it was now the God-orchestrated lifting up time of those who had humbled themselves in the sight of the Lord. Again, to my surprise, many of these were over 50, and many were much older than even that. I remembered that Joshua and Caleb were both in their 80s and the two oldest men in Israel when they entered the Promised Land. I was given understanding that these had allowed the Lord to be their reward and their audience for many, many years. Many had been in intense humbling positions. It's now he's talking about these people that he saw for over 20 years. And in fact, it seemed that there was something significant about those who had submitted to pro the processing of the Lord since 1995. It seemed that one had to remain in a low posture position for an extended time to receive the privileged mantles they now received. Do you get this? Mm -hmm. Shut in, shut up for protection, preparation, and promotion. That's a word that the guy released, former vice president of Zambia at GOZ recently. These were now like superheroes that would carry very advanced healing and revelation gifts as well as amazing God solutions for every area of society. Many of these would become financial giants because of the hand of the Lord lifting them up. I had remained in surprise at the fact that I saw mainly gray and white heads coming to the forefront of the tsunami as I think I had always assumed that youth would lead the next big wave. Okay. Now, this resonated for me because I remember releasing to you one time about the fact that it struck me that Joshua and Caleb were the leaders. Mm -hmm. They weren't the troops, but they were the ones leading the advance when they crossed over. <laughs> we Younger think folks. Of them as youthful. Yeah, but they weren't. They were, they were 80. The seasoned, 
humble yet full of faith sons and daughters of the king are about to be promoted ahead of the arising army of God as the kingdom age kicks into the new gear as an era of shining brightly comes upon the house of God. It all made me want to go a good bit lower before that wave comes in. Watch out for the blue wave of the blue hairs. It's going to be world altering. Okay, those of you 50 and over. Now you said mostly, so it doesn't. But do you get there is this humbling and being shut away and uh, for a time and a season, and this is getting ready to break out. So you are part of this crazy structure. This is the USS, um, shoot, I just, uh, Gerald Ford. It's the new, it's the latest carrier as it's being assembled in the yard, right? This has now been gone out from dry dock. It's, it's been put out into the water. They're finishing the rest of it. It's got a couple more years of work on it. But this is kind of what's been happening here over the past few years, just so you know. This carrier model has been getting traction, but I want you to understand there's something very powerful underneath, and it's these. Those are 21 feet in diameter. There, there's a force under this, and that may not make sense given that we're not packed to the gills here or whatever. We're not some huge, massive gathering, but you have to understand there's a spiritual force here that's working. And here's a, a little better perspective on these. That's well below the waterline, right? That's what's moving what's going on and we can't even see it. But it, it's shifting things around. Okay, so just quickly then, last week we talked about this choice where we focus is going to determine what our inner state is going to be and our inner state is going to end up driving our behavior and that's going to loop back around into the problem. This is the victim cycle. As we fixate on the problem, so this way we really watch your speech. What are you talking about? Now bear in mind, this, this, you could be fine in 12 areas and awful then in another five. Just watch this for wherever you want to harp on the problem and watch what that does to your inner anxiety and then how that creates actions and reactions and it cycles around. And in contrast with that, again, the focus choice, instead of on the problem now, becomes on the vision <coughs> outcome for the future. That sets a very different tone. That's what you've been doing here, right? Recalibrating for a different vision and picture of what God's doing. You're getting that elevated stance. You're getting that AWAC perspective of seeing the bigger picture, understanding even time that way. That then, instead of driving anxiety, needs to drive fuel some passion in you. So when you hear an amen come up, or yeah, you know, that's, that's that passion rising up to a vision of hope of what we're supposed to be. Now, you can't leave here and leave that vision. You've got to hold on to that. So you have to be interceding for everybody here for what you spoke earlier. You release it, but now you have a burden for that. You're supposed to. <laughs> okay? But that means, too, to press in. Bring these people, bring us, the ones you know, to the Lord. Lord, help them get more free. Help them get more heart for the hungry, for the needy, for the lost, for the broken. Work in them, right? Quicken their hearts. Keep that vision so the passion fuels it. And then out of that passion, this is where we so often stumble, is just the baby steps, not the whole trip. Oh, but God, I can never, ever get to Mount Kilimanjaro. Okay, so baby step is go and do some internet research on how people climb Mount Kilimanjaro, right? And then buy a book on it, or go to the library and get a book, or just plan to go to the library so you can look for a book. Baby step, baby step, baby step. We get too far, we try something bigger, and it doesn't happen, and we get, ah, okay, fine, right? This cycle then, the problem doesn't go away. The problem is still there, but rather than being fixated on it, we're looking at a vision for the future. This fits into deliverance work really well because oftentimes people come through the door with overwhelming um, problems or brokenness, um, and you can sit back and be easily discouraged and go, oh my God, it's going to take forever. And I always have, from the very beginning, the Lord put in me to ask for His battle plan for someone. To, what is the vision? What is the outcome? What are we going for? You know, we go in believing they will be healed. And they will come to move in all of their destiny. 
and you know it's just a matter of how fast we're getting there and it's baby steps to it but you start with the vision in mind and that's not even our generic vision for everybody that's God's vision for them Lord what is your battle plan for this particular person where do we start what is our what's our goal here what does their destiny look like so we can help them walk into that mm -hmm. it fits this model perfectly yeah part of the prayer that Kim and I use very different forms of it, but we both pray before we meet with somebody, is help me to see and communicate the vision that you have for them. And it's not our vision. I've, I've come to this interesting phrase about myself. If someone has say, what, what, what really fuels you? And that is that I am jealous for the glory of God. But, and that sounds almost too religious, but the fact of the matter is there's a glory on Martha and I'm <laughs> jealous that that gets to be shown. And that means it's gonna be wild and crazy and I may or may not even like how that looks, mm -hmm. but I'm jealous for it because that's something of God's character. And that's where Martha will be most alive and engaged and dynamic and deployed for kingdom and so other great things will happen. But the crud, the old wounds and the lies of the enemy and then the religious stuff and the limitations and oh, you can't do that or you shouldn't do that or don't say this, all come in there. So I get, I get angry at that stuff. I want to cut it out, right? That's how I have a struggle sometimes with institutions, and particularly sometimes with the institutional church, because too often we've just, we just try to contain, and it's like, no, I want it free, 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 free. You gotta get free of the bondage, but then you gotta get into the boldness. So this cycle works in that way. So again, just remember, this is a victim triangle that works with a victim and then there's always a persecutor and there's always a rescuer, okay? And that the victim doesn't always look this way. Sometimes the victim looks this way. They're just acting it out differently. You think, wow, that person's really a persecutor. No, they're, they, 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 somewhere there's a victim and they're just lashing back. And the persecution can sometimes look like this. It's just situations. And the rescuer sometimes looks like this. It's just blah. So be aware whenever you're getting, if you're too tempted to a zone out experience somewhere, just go, God, am I trying to get rescued from something here? Use it as a trigger. If you're getting real aggressive with something, acting kind of the persecutor, or if you're tempted just to rescue somebody, don't. Be very careful because you want to help people, but if you rescue them, you're telling them you're just a victim. Mm -hmm. And that's not who they are. So. Instead of these roles then, we want, instead of the victim, we're gonna come in with understanding because of God, we're a co-creator with God. And instead of a persecutor, you want the challenger. And instead of the rescuer, you want a coach who's not gonna step in and do it for you, but okay, this is where you're going. Come on, come on, come on. I was just coaching Michaela right there, right? Yeah. Calling it up, come on, girl. You keep that, that's, that's a clear fire for her, right? That's part of her voice. It's part of her sound she brings in. She needs to stay true to that. Watch it, see how it works out. Okay, so we are God's coworker in his service. And remember this word in the Greek phrase in there, we get the word synergy. There's a synergy with God. There's a co-creation with God that we're supposed to be about. Okay, I'm gonna, I just feel so important to me that you get this. I don't wanna be hammering you to death, but we have to, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna Dip into this for a second because I go, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute, but God is our rescuer. So let's, let's look, I, I sent out a request for you to be reading Psalm 18, okay? Because it's amazing. And what I've done here is I've taken Psalm 18, but I've rewritten it just from first person and in the present. Instead of something God's done past or will do, something God is doing. The cords of death entangled me. The torrents of destruction overwhelmed me. The cords of the grave coiled around me and the snares of death confront me. In my distress, I called to you, Lord. I cried to you for help. Now, question, is he a victim? No. This is David. He's not a victim, but he's in a situation where he's being victimized, yeah. okay? This is a real, real important distinction. And you'll see it play out through the rest of the Psalm. But listen, watch this response. From your temple you hear my voice. My cry comes before you into your ears. The earth trembles and quakes. The foundations of the mountains shake. They tremble because you are angry. Smoke rises from your nostrils. Consuming fire comes from your mouth. Burning coals blaze out of it. You part the heavens and come down. Dark clouds are under your feet.
But God doesn't feel anything, obviously. Sorry. That goes back a few weeks ago, right? About God not having any emotion. Oh, I don't know. David seemed to think he did. Okay, so I'm going to go with David rather than the theologians. You mount the cherubim and fly. You soar on the wings of the wind. You make darkness your covering, your canopy around you, the dark rain clouds of the sky. Out of the brightness of your presence, clouds advance with hailstones and bolts of lightning. You, Lord, thunder from heaven, and your voice, my most high, resounds. Yes. <laughs> okay, I mean, David just laying it out here. You shoot your arrows and scatter the enemy. With great bolts of lightning you rout them. The valleys of the sea are exposed and the foundation of the earth are laid bare at your rebuke, Lord, at the blast of breath from your nostrils. <sighs> okay, are you getting? Yeah. David understands where the power is, right? Last week we were looking at David on the field with Goliath. And he is tapping into the same reality yes. of the same power of God in the face of the enemy. So he's just describing here, understand, he understands as a co-creator yes. who he's connected to. That's right. <laughs> mm -hmm. oh, Lord. And then here's the part. You reach down from on high and you take hold of me. You draw me out of deep waters. You rescue me from my powerful enemy, from my foes who are too strong for me. They confront me in the day of my disaster, but you, Lord, support me. Mm. You bring me out to a spacious place. You rescue me because you delight in me. Amen. Okay? So God does repeatedly do this, have to because the power's in him, but David is activating with that. Yes. And, and you can't just stop here. So we're going to keep going. You, my Lord, deal with me according to my righteousness and the cleanness of my hands. You reward me. This is going to freak some of you out. For I keep your ways, my Lord. I am not guilty of turning from you. All of your words are before me. I do not turn away from your degrees, decrees. I am blameless before you and keep myself from sin. How many of you can say that? I can say it as David said it. Good. <laughs> now I want you to watch this next one. To the faithful you show yourself faithful. Oh, wait. You reward me according to my righteousness according to the cleanness of my hands in your sight. Oh. Oh. How does that change things? In your sight. How does it change things? Right. What's the critical component here? What's come into place for us? Yeah. The blood of the Lamb. The blood of the Lamb, the blood of the Lamb. You have to lay hold of the totality of the psalm. Yes. You have to lay hold of the totality of what David gets here. To the faithful you show yourself faithful, to the blameless you show yourself blameless. To the pure you show yourself pure, but to the devious, I love this, this is amazing, mm -hmm. you show yourself shrewd. Mm -hmm. And he basically identifies who the devious are here. You save the humble, but bring low those whose eyes are haughty. Now, we're going to wrap up here because I want you to understand the co-laborer, the co-creator part here. You, Lord, keep my lamp burning. You, my God, turn my darkness into light. With your help, help I advance against the truth. I am not going to sit on my butt and wait for you to do all that because I have a requirement to advance. With you as my God, I scale a wall. As for you, your way is perfect and your word is flawless. You shield all who take, take refuge. refuge. Okay, there's, there's, yeah. I have a part here. I'm co so there's time to, for who is God besides you and who is the rock except you? It is you who arms me with strength and keeps my way secure. You make my feet like the feet of a deer. You cause me to stand on the heights. Yes. Does he sound like a victim here? Yes. No. Okay, just so we're, we're clear. You train my hands for battle and my arms bend a bow of bronze. You give me your shield of victory and your right hand sustains me. And here's my favorite line right here. You stoop down to make me great. <laughs> so I want you to say this. You, Lord... 
stoop down, down to make me great. <laughs> it's, it's a wonderful perspective, isn't it? I mean, to make me great, he's got to stoop down. I love that. It's yeah. like, okay, if there was a question of being humble about this, you get over it, right? Because he's got to stoop down to do this. <laughs> he's got to stoop down. But his goal is to make you great Amen. in the kingdom. Yes. Right? And he's so for us. Yes, he is. You broaden the path beneath me so that my ankles do not turn. You are getting a broad place. You are getting a broad place. I'm releasing this by the Spirit. You are getting a broad place to stand. That which is felt narrow is getting broad. Mm -hmm. So your ankles don't turn. Okay? Mm -hmm. I pursue... Listen, what? Who? What? Who's saying this? David. I pursue my enemies and overtake them. I do not turn back until they are destroyed. I crush them so they cannot rise. They fall beneath my feet. Whoa! Okay. What happened to the guy back there with the coils of death encircling him? Woe is me, pitiful me. You didn't hear woe is me, pitiful me, did you? I pursue my enemies. I do not turn back. I crush them. Who, who is David? Now, who are we supposed to understand from this? Who are our enemies? All those spirits of fear, of accusation that are trying to take you out, of shame and saying, there is no way. I'm not going to submit to you. I'm going to stay after you. I crush you under my feet. Okay? God's going like, I've given you dominion over that thing. You rise up and, yes. and God take away the shame. God goes, no, I already gave you the power and authority. You deal yes. with it. Yes, now you're talking. Come on. Okay? <laughs> I mean, okay. will God take it away? No. I, you know, That's right. yeah. two feet, two heels, go get it, crush it. Okay. You arm me with strength for battle. You humble my adversaries before me. You make my enemies turn their backs in flight. Yes. And I destroy my foes. See, God makes the enemies turn their back. Yes. They're frightened because the blood comes down. And they're like, oh, right. crap. They're already frightened. Step out and crush them. You know, it's like cockroaches with the lights going on. Yes. Oh, squish. Ugh. Okay. <laughs> This is interesting. They cry for help, but there is no one to save them. To you, but you do not answer. I beat them as fine as wind-blown dust. I trample them like mud in the streets. You deliver me from the attacks of the people. You make me the head of nations. The head and not the tail, folks. Not so that you lord it over anybody, but so you can serve them and see them come into freedom and to joy, into health and restoration. It's about kingdom. They're going to have even more freedom to do wrong in kingdom, just so you know. There's more freedom because God wants them free so they can really, really choose. And, uh, and he wants them to choose them, but he won't, he won't force himself. So we're moving from that stigma to saturation, from the abandonment to abundance, harassment to harvest. And we've got to get out of the victim and into the co-creator phase. Yeah. Okay, and all this is just to bring you back up again to that the view from 30,000 feet. Yes. So when you're down and you're like, okay, I can't see, you got that, recalibrate, recalibrate, recalibrate. No battle carrier group goes out without four to five of these planes in the arsenal. One is airborne at all time and it's watching out over the big picture, big picture, big picture. You may be down three layers below deck greasing a cable that's going to launch a plane wondering what the heck am I doing down here, right? That's my how it feels. But you're part of something much, much bigger. Those propellers are underneath and they're churning, they're churning, they're churning. We are not where we were last week and we will not be where we are tonight, next week, because this is moving. This is a new model, and God's going to take it and move it into more and move it into more, okay? You're part of this. Just stay tuned. Not everybody can hang on to the ride. People will come. People will go. It's okay. Not their model. Don't worry about it. You show up. You stay true to what God's doing for you, showing you in the times and seasons. Track with him. Lord, we break off any victim mindset that's still yeah. trying to hang on. The old stuff, the old paradigm, the woe is me. Yes, Lord. 
Lord, we just call up that heart of David to come against the enemy so then we can show great mercy. We can be compassion beyond belief. We can be so kind and gentle because it's coming out of that solid place that you've broadened a place. Lord, thank you that you stooped down to make every person here great. So Lord, I call up the image of those planes getting ready to launch. Head and not the tail. That's right. Not to dominate somebody, but to serve them, to come against the plans of the enemy, to speak a right word in time, to confront evil, to fight for light and life. Lord, we love you. We thank you for the way you're moving in us and that you haven't left us alone. Lord, I'm excited about what you... I'm terrified sometimes, but I'm excited about what you're doing. And Lord, I just thank you for these here who pray for us and stand with us, that you'll keep them strong, keep them from falling overboard, strapped in, ready to go, engines revved, and getting launched out for kingdom. Lord, just show them how dangerous they are. Show them how dangerous they are. The enemy knows it. The enemy is afraid of them getting that word. So we loose the truth of it now. In the name and for the glory of Jesus. Amen. So we're going to go right into... Go ahead. What? I've been seeing that this shift that we're in, this time between Passover and Pentecost, has a lot to do with... We spend a lot of time becoming able to see ourselves as warriors and see ourselves as the pilots in those planes on the flight board. But I think the shift has a lot to do with we have now established that we are God's warriors. We get that, but we're not at the back of the pack. We're not running to keep up with the rest of the troops. We're not hiding in fear, you know, when the rest of them go out to battle. We are not, there are many in this group that are leaders of the troops. Mm -hmm but we are brave like David is and because he knew the authority he stood in. This is an opportunity to come to recognize and learn the authority in Christ you stand in. And I remember people spoke to me about that for years and years and I'm like, when am I ever gonna get that? And I had to begin to ask him for that. Help me to understand, Lord, the significance and the depth and the strength of your authority. Help me to get who I am in you and what it is I walk in. And that changed my life. I think that's where we're at right now. And we each need to ask individually for that. And even when you come to know that, you continue to ask for that. Because he gives you greater responsibility and more authority as time goes on. Yes. But I think one of the biggest problems is that we don't understand who we are in him. And we think that's just going to eventually maybe fall on our heads if we read the word of God long enough or we hang out and be Christians in the church long enough. We have to go after it. David went after. David knew who he was. From the time he was a child going up against Goliath, he knew who he was. And he stood in faith, even in the pit of hell that often that he went through. The attack will always come in that identity, right? That's why the tempter, Satan, coming against the Son of God, if you are the Son of God, then dot, dot, dot. If you are. I mean, it's just, it's always back to identity, back to identity, back to identity. But it's so exciting to come up against the gates of hell on a daily basis and have no fear. Mm -hmm. Yes. yes. Oh, Amen. That's Amen. Amen. It says no more fainting, no more whining. Speak to it. Yes. Speak to it. Yes. Mm -hmm. Don't receive it. Just speak to it. No more crying, yes. no more whimpering, no more murmuring. Just speak to it. I've given you that authority. Mm -hmm. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yep. And just call in the heaven vision. Yes. See, again, we're, again, if we, if we looking at the gates, oh no, that's, oh, you know, we're <laughs> looking at the problem. Heaven's got an agenda for those gates. Yes. You just want to call that agenda into place. I agree with heaven's agenda. Those are not going to prevail against the forward movement of the body of Jesus. I'm, I'm calling that into place, right? David with Goliath, you have defied the armies of the living God. You know, you have crossed that line. I'm so sorry for you. Be uncircumcised. Yeah, because okay. the Israel army have forgotten who they were. Here they are getting up every day 
putting on armor and standing in a line and do absolutely nothing because they forgot to who they were aligned with. They forgot that they were delivered. They forgot who they served. So God called up a child who had a relationship with him to do what? Stand yes. in the faith and promise of God. We you know, all these men every day, getting up every day, putting on the whole armor and just staying out of line all day long. What is that? <laughs> so help us, Lord, every yes. one of us in this room, yes. to know who we who yes. we are yes. in you and stand in the authority that David did. Yes. 